and welcome to Sub Stories. I'm Sylvia. I'm the friend who gets you into shows, yet you don't know what I do for a living. And I'm Ricky. I'm the friend that's begging you to go see bands that you've probably never heard of. On today's episode, we're speaking with Mike Snow and Margot Flint from Boston Calling Music Festival. Yeah, and we go back to WFN next days. Without that radio station, this moment wouldn't have happened. So they've done a lot of things, but what are your actual titles, Mike? Uh, technically, I would be COO of Boston Calling Events. Margo? Uh, I'm the partnerships director, but I have a focus on local um, businesses, businesses that are based in Boston. Yeah, you sound like me with my titles. I have so many. I... <laughs> it's like, what are you doing? I'm, I'm here. Which one do we go with? <laughs> I've been with the festival since 2014, and you know we just haven't taken it that seriously. It's like, I'm just the, the gal that does the partnership. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I guess we could even start there. Like, that's how I, I know you. You were my rep at WFNX. And you always have that story how I was mean to you. I don't, I, ca I can't believe that I was because I'm such a delightful person. But um, yeah, I mean, that's where it started for us and, and FNX. And I mean, uh, I guess we could go back to that. And and Mike, you were the promotions director. Am I is that correct? Yeah. Unlike Margo, I did every job at FNX and the Phoenix, um, including uh, yeah. sales. Uh, that's why I'm I'm such a good partner of Margo's because I was uh, a really bad version of Margo for about 16 months at the Phoenix. But yeah, we uh, uh, you know I did promotions coordinator. Ultimately, ended up marketing director. Um, so you know go back to the your first sentence. Uh, yeah, you were the one I always emailed to go to the Palladium and see bands nobody knew about. It was great. <laughs> yeah, I, I did the same thing to Sylvia as well. <laughs> but I yeah, was like 15. Did. Yeah, he's very young. He was one of my street teamers. I did not know like that. That's how we went back and we found emails going back to like 2007. Yeah, it yeah. Was, I have the archives of emails. I probably have emails from you guys back there. Still, I keep all my emails, the receipts. I actually tried to find an email where I had written your copy for one of your shows. I couldn't find it, but thank goodness. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank goodness. Yeah. I just remember FNX was just so amazing to work with for, for the warp tour. Cause nobody really, nobody else really got what that tour was. Cause I mean, yes, towards the end, people understood what it was, but in the beginning it was, it's kind of like the Boston calling thing where it, it's like, what are you trying to do here? What is this thing? Like we were doing events on side stages in, you know, Western mass where it was like, you know, it was a cow pasture next door, you know? So, <laughs> I mean, um, so I, I really appreciated, you know, both of you in the station in, in Phoenix, just for, for supporting it. Um, and for, you know, our tiny ad, ad buys that we would have, cause the budget was terrible at that time. And I apologize if I was mean. Well, that <laughs> That's how Boston Calling started. Um, you know, we built the first, you know, financial model with like the interim CFO who was there and walked into Steven's office and said, we got this great idea for you, Steven Mindich, the, the owner of the Phoenix. And I uh, said, well, the city said we could put, put up a fence and we'll charge $10 and 17 cents instead of doing this like free show. And then, you know, whatever money you make from sponsors and stuff you can keep. And he pulled a huge drag off his like hundreds that he used to smoke in his office and was like, <laughs> In 2003, I lost $80,000 on Iggy Pop. If you want to do a concert, call Live Nation. <laughs> like that was it, like meeting meeting over. Um, oh, man. And, uh, you know, Brian and I sort of took the idea and ran with it from there. But it was, uh, it, it was, that guy was unbelievable. It was hilarious. And then the first year, you, how did City Hall Plaza become a thing? Like I, you know, it's awesome that you did it in the city because everything's always outside. Um, but why City Hall Plaza? It's just that's where we had been using, you know, the plaza for FNX shows, right? We did free shows out there. We did what, Taking Back Sunday, Fountains of Wayne, I think might have even been like the last one. So we just had a good relationship with City Hall. There was a guy, Chris Cook, who I think was like the head of marketing and special events, maybe. Um, so we were planning, you know, another FNX show there. And we we just kind of went in and said, well, if we could, we could fence it off and we could charge admission, right? And you know, that was kind of a new thing for that. And it's a public space. And they went through the lawyers and stuff and said, yeah, there's actually not not a problem with you doing that. Um, so that's that's 
kind of where it started. I mean, after we had the first two there, uh, we worked with Chris on, you know, other locations around the city potentially, but, you know, Chris Cook was a big proponent of like, no, 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 we want this like right in the heart of the city. And Mayor Menino just thought it was great, you know, to have. And, um, you know, he kind of liked any big events, you know, he kind of had this vision of, you know, success to him was looking out the window and seeing lots of cranes, right? Because he knew business was good and people were building and, you know, it was kind of the same thing of like, okay, well, build, build it here in our backyard and 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 we'll do something new here. Yeah. That's cool. Those early lineups. So I never got to go to any of the until it moved over to Harvard. Um, but my wife went every single year. So when I when we met, we were talking about concerts. She was like, Oh, you ever go to Boston Calling? And we met in 2018. And I was like, Oh, yeah, like I went last year for the first time. Like I was always bartending, saying so it was always on a weekend, so I could never make it out. And it was like her favorite thing to do. And then I would go back and look through those old lineups. I was so jealous of like the replacements and Nas and just early Kendrick Lamar. Like you guys really nailed it with bringing in different artists and, and putting them all together. I mean, for me personally, like my music collection is so vast. So having a festival so close that has a little bit of everything was like the coolest thing that's ever happened. And that's kind of to Sylvia's point about Warp Tour, right? We were like kind of finding our way. Like the second one was really basically like an EDM concert, you know, because on paper we were like, well, the college students are coming back. It can be this different thing in September because we used to do the two a year. And, you know, maybe May can be like the alt indie one and September can be this more like young dance one. Um, and, you know, the the date didn't work. Like the lineup was was great. But, you know, it, it's funny. We it, we used we did seven shows on City Hall Plaza, and I would think you know each one of them is, is is fairly unique. And then I think sort of the last two or three, we like hit our stride of like, okay, this is you know more of an all dinty Americana, you know, light hip hop sort of event here, and 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 that seems to be working, and it seemed to be you know the right mix of people, and we've always had a very docile crowd, thankfully. I mean, even you know Metallica and and things like that. It's like it's that that that's kind of about as as hard as it's ever been. Yeah, I was, I mean, the, some of those Harvard ones, like seeing Tool and Eminem and like just these shows where some of the, I mean, I didn't get to see either of those bands when I was younger. So it was really great to get to see them, you know, in my mid thirties, but it was also cool. Cause it was like, oh, we're all in our mid thirties. Like everybody's so chill. There's no, like, there's nothing crazy happening. If you're just enjoying these epic bands helpful for us over the years you know it's just sort of like you know you, you don't have you know other extraneous problems or you know uh different departments in the city weighing in and say oh my god that was like really dangerous or something so it's it's been helpful yeah and how did uh you loop in margo to to help you with partnerships and and i can't even imagine like you approaching like hey we're doing this i mean i know there was the the fnx model but now this is going to be big and we want more money. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so, you know, our background was partnerships, right? We had had, you know, lat we had grown up like in that corporate environment of like, yeah, you know, partnerships are part of every business. And well, <laughs> Margo, you and I were joking about this. I think at the last one, right. It was the, the WFNX Boston Phoenix best music poll on Lansdowne street presented by Budweiser. Like I, I was doing, weekend, I was doing weekend radio at the time. And I remember being in the meeting where we had to like name this thing, you know, and you're looking at this like sheet of liner paper and you're like, all right, next up, you know, oh, this is, you know, Silver Sun, you know, Silver Sun Phoenix. They're going to join us at the WFNX Boston Phoenix best music poll on Lansdowne Street presented by Budweiser. You were like, well, it just rolls off the tongue. Like this is wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we had some things we didn't want to do um, like that, um, but you know, the, the team of people we put in place, sort of the, the investment team behind the original Boston Calling, like that was all part of it. And City Hall Plaza was such a like a, a small space, right? So kind of looked at the steps and said, well, we can sell a couple of these. And I think there was Margo. And then um, there was another old friend like in New York. Um, and it was just kind of, you, you just went with people who had some existing local relationships. And, and you know, we, we kind of did it like we always did. We, you know, created kind of a funny looking PowerPoint deck and Margo and I, would set up meetings and like show up to converse with cookies and just be like, hi, you know, we're a new festival. So, um, yeah, we it was everywhere. Converse, it was, balance. It was, 
I mean, it wasn't that odd. It was it was pretty normal. Newberry Comics, right? We just called uh, all the people we knew. Yep. Yeah. But I actually didn't. I wasn't at the very first festival because we had had a meeting and I was pregnant and I had just taken a job at WGBH. Um, so I said no for the first festival, but then after I saw it, I mean, how could I not work with these guys in this, this amazing event? So, um, the activations and the experiences have just next level, like last year, like it, you know, sometimes you, I'm, I'm a marketer too at heart. Right. So, but I hate when I'm marketed too, cause I'm like, oh, I see right through you, but <laughs> that, that I gotta say <laughs> that chase lounge was brilliant because like if you had the card and you were very hot or whatever you just want to chill out or have a drink or whatever you could go in there and I did I did sign up so that is one of my favorite card cards now and I feel like I'm doing a spot for Chase they should sponsor this episode but anyway um <laughs> but um but the other thing that you did was you brought in um I don't know who but like it was a cannabis sponsor like Happy Valley and I had never really seen that at a major festival. And I was just like, well, how is this going to work? And I, I think it's worked brilliantly, like with the, with the stage naming and I, and it's out in the open. It's not hidden. Like, you know, like all dispensaries or some down in some industrial alley somewhere. And this is like out in the open at a festival and like all props to you for like being first and now other festivals are doing it. I mean, how did that come about that? That was a thing. I mean, yeah, Margo, I mean, it was, it was your client. Um, and I think, I think they're a different style of company. They, 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 they appreciate marketing and branding. I, um, it's Jeff, right? I always space his name. Um, no, Greg, sorry. Greg. Uh, you know, okay. Greg, you know, is, is a marketing guy, you know, it's just mm -hmm. like, you know, they have their location down by the airport. They have their facility up in Gloucester and he sort of understands like, okay, how am I going to stand out in this fairly new crowded marketplace? Um, and, you know, there was the Margo side and then there was, uh, you know, we had a different parent company at the time who was like totally against cannabis. And uh, then we had, you know, to speak with like Harvard and the city and sort of say, listen, there will be no cannabis, right? They understand it. It's a branding play, right? Like, um, you know, they, they know all the rules. And I mean, it, it came together quicker than we thought. Um, mm -hmm. but, That's great. but I think I think they get it. They understand the festival. Um, he's a huge music nerd, right? So like, mm -hmm. that's like the founder of just like, he's like, I have to be here. I love music. I love live music. Yeah. He said he's yeah, been to like, like 500 shows or something, Margo, that time. Oh, wow. Who, Michael Lonsdale. or Greg? Greg. Michael Greg. the CEO Greg. Oh, Greg. Yeah, he's in a band. He has like, he has a practice space up in Gloucester. So yeah. he's, yeah. Yeah. I, like I mean, the thing is, you know, it's being a partner at the festival has changed so much since when I started, it was, you know, at the beginning it was a lot of like tents and, you know, you're putting up maybe like a step and repeat and giving out a few free swag items and calling it a day. But now it's really a part of a lot of companies sort of like 360 uh, marketing plan. So it, activations have become very sophisticated. They tour, you know, you have these traveling shipping crates, just like the chase lounge. I mean, it looks so good. You could think that that was an actual structure that is there all the time. You know, you don't even know it's a pop-up. Um, so, but people are really getting it now. And when you're a partner at the festival, you're not just marketing to people you're making memories with them and it's something that you can't really get like if I'm you know I, I'm not sitting around saying oh remember that time we saw that Doritos commercial during the Super Bowl no but I'm remembering when you know I was at the festival and I did a mechanical surfboard randomly or it was pouring rain and Subaru handed me a poncho and like I'll never forget that uh, so it's really a part of the experience. People go not only to see the acts, but you need a little downtime too. So they'll go and they'll do all the different experiences. And it just, you know, you understand that that brand gets you and is helping you, you know, have these great memories. And it's, it's just sort of a symbiotic relationship. Um, and it's just come a long way. The Subaru ponchos were clutch. Like, <laughs> 
<laughs> what a genius move to just have those on hand because I just remember everybody had a Subaru poncho. <laughs> Right. That's the thing. And, and, you know, from a marketing standpoint, that has legs because then you're taking pictures of, you know, that exactly. time in mm -hmm. the pouring rain. And so then, you know, your brand is on Instagram and it just is, it sort of perpetuates. But it's always interesting how much time people spend not watching bands. And I'm sure you remember that from Warp Tour. You're like, there's five stages. Like, why is the monster yeah. activation like bumping right now? <laughs> like, yeah. There's five or stages. How is this possible? Yeah. Well, can we also talk about the food? Because <laughs> like I like you guys curate that and I love it. Like there there's been some selections of like obviously Roxy's grilled cheese is my favorite, but like there's like ice cream that I've never had before. And um and then last year I for the first time got I bought the platinum wristband and I can't go back and I blame you when I look at my bank account, but it's worth every penny, can I just say? Cause like like I was saying, I'm old. I don't want to be around people too much. <laughs> and there's parking. Cause that's like, we always talk about this on the podcast where like, if you want me to go somewhere, there better be parking because <laughs> I'm not going to go if there isn't. And it's perfect. Like you, it's just an elevated experience. And even this year you've added even more things that I didn't think you could add to the platinum. Um, I like that there's like these chefs that you, you highlight. And then I start looking them up and I discover new, new people that I should be uh, paying attention to. So, um, yeah, I, yeah we, we've done like some of our survey stuff and food is number two behind bands, which, yeah. which is yeah. really interesting. It's a uh, highly curated food lineup. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That Jaju pierogi is the absolute move. Like <laughs> they are so good and it's just the best being able to watch some of my favorite bands and just like crush pierogies. Yeah. I lived for two days on like the mama Lay's pickles. <laughs> uh, just because it's like you, you, you just you're kind of running around and it's just like you, you don't you don't really want to sit and eat a meal right so it's like usually like almonds and beef jerky and then you find like one of these random things or one year margo had a kombucha company i'm like well this is like actually a really great like six o'clock pick me up like just slam this yeah. bottle of kombucha right or whatever so <laughs> yeah we always find interesting things that i you know you, you could spend a lot of time during the food yeah the the fumu um company last year whatever you get up there whatever and it's all like vegan ice cream you know and you're like mm -hmm. this is delicious i don't care what what is in this right now uh, it's so awesome um so i mean i know we talked a little bit about it but like how drastic is was the change on your end from going from like city hall over to the Harvard complex. Like I know it's obviously more people, but did that just become a completely different animal for you? Uh, yeah, it was, I mean, we, you know, I'm pretty humble guy and I'm the operator and I bring in, you know, all the stuff in the people. And like, I mean, I got run over every day, multiple times, you know, and just it rained, you know, we got like three inches of rain on that Thursday. Right. So you know, semi trucks are like two feet in the mud, right? There's like ponds everywhere. Like, you know, we're, we're a, we're like a five to six person team, you know, and then, uh, and then it sort of swells into this, you know, 37 department, 1200 person, like, you know, thing. Um, but yeah, it's just, we had never operated at Harvard more, more than the size of the event. It's always the space that you're in. Um, you know, we had done some, some shows out in Wisconsin and, you know, the piece of land we would use was literally a flood, you know, plane with like fish swimming around in it in April. And we Those got there we got there in June and it was like, you know, it was beautiful. And it was like, oh, okay, you, you know, you literally have to learn about like, you know, the soil density and, and crazy things like that at some of these events. So yeah, it was a whole different beast. Um, I think we were fortunate uh, about our crowd, you know, that was constantly like the upside was that we would have just a great crowd. It was kind of in it. And they gave us the leniency of like, it's your first event and you can't help if it rains and stuff. But yeah. I mean, Thursday, Friday was just unbelievable. <laughs> I remember that Friday, I think was Chance the Rapper who headlined that first one. Yep. And I, I love Chance the Rapper, but like, I, I forget who played before, but I just remember it was like downpouring. And then during Chance, there was a part where everybody went to jump but like my feet were completely covered in mud. And I was like, how are these people moving? Like you can't, you couldn't get any lift off of the ground. It was, but it was like one of the best sets I've ever seen. It's amazing. 
Yeah, the, the the weather, you know, it's like always. I mean, even our first one on City Hall Plaza, it was like 46 and raining. Ugh. It's like you go back and look at the pictures and everybody looks like they're dressed for a snowstorm, you know, and it's Memorial Day weekend, right? It's just like you just see hoods and hats and in like real jackets, you know? So we, you know, that part of May, I think will always exist. But that yeah. first festival, you know, we, we planned it much the same. We had much of the same crew, the same people, you know, the advance with the artists was a lot different because... You know, you're dealing with Chance the Rapper's security director, you know, like, no offense, but like, we just hadn't had anybody, you know, ask us the laundry list of questions, right? Yeah. Um, you know, just artist catering and artist comforts, right? To build an artist, you know, enclosure for a, a, an, an artist that big. We had, you know, just didn't have a lot of experience with that. We were lucky that the team of people we hired did. But there was just like that that was like one of a million matchsticks, you know, like along the way that you're like, OK, this is this is just going to take a, a, a different level of communication. You know, once you start dealing with, you know, Chance the Rapper, the M&Ms of the world, Mumford and Sons, you know, they, they, they're, they you know, they they all had great representation we had dealt with before. But you started really started really uncovering like this is a huge, huge lift. You know, yeah. transportation, you know, it's like, oh, Chance needs nine dedicated vehicles for 24 hours a day for two days, you know, wow. and they use them. The crew runs all over the place. People work at different times. If, you, if Chance the Rapper wants to put his show on, that's what he needs. And yeah. you, you sold tickets to see Chance the Rapper, so go get it done. You know, I'm using Chance. It wasn't like he was more yeah. or less difficult than anybody, but it's just that level of of artist and that show that they want to put out. And once yeah. you elect to do it, you know, you better make it happen because you have all these fans that are there to see it. Yeah, the level of production has just gone up like for everybody. Mm -hmm. And that must be one of the things that you've noticed over the years, like starting at City Hall and then going over here and just everything's video screens, everything's all these. It's not just a backdrop. <laughs> so, yeah, I can't imagine. At, at City Hall Plaza, the, the biggest production we had was actually Alt-J. Um, mm -hmm they had all of these like moving smaller video panels. And at the time, the equipment they came with, you know, it all arcs and it all moves at the same time, right? So we had like half a city's worth of power plugged into the stage, right? <laughs> and we were like, like, man, you know, we made it through that and the show went good and the generator didn't break. Like, oh, this is awesome. And then Nine Inch Nails showed up to Harvard. <laughs> and you were like, oh, okay. Now we have a skyscraper plugged into the stage. <laughs> So yeah, it, it's it's like I said, it's, it's a thousand matchsticks, and you you learn in my position about a million things, and then Margot just gets to hear the funny stories while she's like hanging out with Subaru. <laughs> oh no, I'm I'm sure she's putting out fires and going. Are you happy? Would you please come back again? And please also, I, I looked for a lot less zip ties than I did, you know, when we first started. <laughs> <laughs> but but you know like that that's the same thing like that you know margo was like hanging banners and carrying tent weights on city hall plaza right now it's like we've got a seven person you know partnership team you know that is there so margo isn't putting up a sign you know and if you do it right margo doesn't have to put up a sign and yeah. sometimes margo still puts up a sign i was gonna say she probably will get down and dirty and do that <laughs> sure. yeah, too. absolutely uh well the one constant though I know with the festival is that logo, right? And for many years, I thought that was Josh Bodies or Josh Smith's dog, dogs. Yeah, they have the terrier. <laughs> and I was just like, oh my god, it's Ray Ray. Anytime I go in, I would want to take a photo. Well, I still do because I'm a nerd like that. But how did that come about? I mean, first of all, why? What was like? Where did the name come from? Boston Calling, and then that very distinct logo. Like, where did that come from? Yeah, I mean the, the so the original name. Um, are like the team of people we were with were, were New York City based. Um, and it started out with the like, well, it's got to be like Boston, right? Like, you know, I, I forget there was like, one of them was like the Sons of Liberty Festival or something like something that like was, we didn't, you know, we didn't like being in Boston. We're like, ah, that's not authentic Boston. I know you think it is or whatever. So mm -hmm. it was a group of people went round and round. I think Boston Calling came from my partner, Brian. I, I, I don't truly remember, but we were just sort of like, okay, like this, this works. Um, and then the dog came from our original design team, you know, we were getting, you know, versions of Paul Revere's horse and the, the, you know, Bunker Hill monument. And, you know, I used to get really frustrated at FNX because I would call the Phoenix design team and I would get back a radio or an antenna or a guitar <laughs> every time. 
Hey, I need the shirts this year. Oh, here's a freaking guitar. You're a radio station. Yeah. Oh, here's a, here's a speaker. Isn't this great? And you're like, no, or Paul that. Revere worth a guitar. <laughs> yeah. And if right, they said, I don't want radio related, you got a picture of the Prue, right? Like that's just how it yeah. always. <clears throat> um, and this dog, there was just like this dog head, like stuck in the back of like a, of, of a, uh, of a design packet. And one of them had a bowler hat with ears coming out of it, like this whole thing. And we, we all sort of was like, oh man, what's up with this dog? Right. And then I don't know how the original dog got like Andrew Jackson's bust, you know, but <laughs> it was like, I'm, I, I'm, I'm shady on how that kind of came about, but it was our like original design team. And we kind of just liked it. And it was like, oh man, that's kind of a good idea. It's a Boston Terrier. And we had to make sure, you know, it didn't look like BU's logo. Um, mm. And then over the years, you know, we've just been pitched a million times. So like my standard is like the dog doesn't have a name. It doesn't have a gender. And Jesus Christ, it doesn't walk and talk. It doesn't even have paws. Right. It's just it's just a dog. Just it's just that's it. Because like uh, outside Lands Festival used to have a ranger. I think it was like Ranger Dave or something. It was kind of like a Smokey the Bear guy. Um, he he was the voice of social media. Right. Like this this Smokey the Bear guy. And yeah. Yeah. No, the dog doesn't talk. It doesn't have a name. <laughs> poor, poor dog. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and you just brought up social media. Can I just say your social media just kills it like in real yeah. time when I'm watching like just like the drones and everything. I can't even imagine like I, I mean, I didn't have the luxury of that back in the war tour days, but like I, it just blows me away with how they can edit it that quickly and get it up and and I'm now I'm following their accounts, the company that you guys use. And I'm just like, they're amazing. Like, yeah. But how do you coordinate that? Like, I, you know, it's like, here, this is what we, is there like, sh like, here's the shots we want, or they just know this is what no, we, we need. Our, our, we have sort of two people who kind of work on our marketing, Lindsay and Pete work directly with them and give them like a fairly large shot list. You know, another thing that we learned over the festival, we'd have these photography teams and you would get wonderful shots of all the bands after the mm -hmm. event. And that's great. You can use some of them, but it was folders and folders and folders of them and cool for archival purposes, but not great for marketing. Right. Yeah. So, you know, there was like bolt on solutions. I had a friend who's a cookbook photographer and I'm like, Ken, just come for a day and a half and just shoot food vendors. And he did, you know, and it's like mm -hmm. this stupid grilled cheese shot that's been shown a thousand times. Yeah. Right. It's just, you know, because you just had one folder of food shots. Right. And, you're yep. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, we, that was another, you know, um, once you kind of move to the next level and you're just like, okay, this is, this is much more than archival, right? This is like, there's, there's, we've been fortunate enough to have people come to this, you know, from all over the country and they, they, they follow along Memorial day and you see them interacting with you and, you know, wish I was there and all of that. And, but yeah, they, there's, there's a team, there's an, there's a, there's a room in the hockey arena that is just filled with computers and people and drone operators. And they're just, yeah, they, they fly. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. As a professional social media marketer, it's definitely uh, impressive what you guys have going on. It's awesome. The cameras are everywhere and I'm always trying to dodge them. I'm like, <laughs> I just want to eat my FOMO ice cream sandwich. And there's like a guy buzzing by you and you're like, oh. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and for me, it's like, I have, you know, the grounds guy from Harvard, I have Cambridge landscaping, I have a live and I have like the CCTV. And it's like every time, you know, some fork operator drives over the grass or something, you're just like, oh, you are being recorded. Like, do not do that. Okay. <laughs> we we will absolutely know why that the patch of grass is destroyed. <laughs> Get the bill. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. So with this year's lineup being like as diverse as it is, who is like the ideal Boston calling attendee? Like who who's the who's the festival like marketed towards um, i mean i don't think we have sort of one you know it's 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 it, you know gender makeup has always kind of been really close to 50 50 you know which is crazy because that's just not how a lot of events go right you're just like oh we booked metallica right you just think of like me right and my three high school buddies right we're going out we're going to see metallica again right and and that's just that's just not the case um so i mean we, we've we've always done really well, you know, Margot, correct me, but it's, it's 25, 45, you know, uh, we, we do get. Right. I think it skews a little bit older than you might think, but I, there, that's just kind of Boston for you. And, you know, it's like, it's right on the cusp of college kids leaving. 
Um, you know, and it is designed to sort of be a long day of like, you know, enjoying a beer and hanging out. So it definitely attracts a 21 plus crowd for the most part. But uh, yeah, I'd say 25 to 44 is a sweet spot. And we get a lot of kids. Little kids. Yeah. Like, like people, you know, they come out, they bring their little kids for a couple yeah. hours, you know, then, you know, the sitter, the grandparent or somebody, you know, you see, you see the person leave with the kid and then you see them skip back without the kid, you know, <laughs> like, so, you know yeah, it, it happens, you know, it happens, it happens quite a bit. So um, it, it's nice that, you know, families sort of think of it as like, okay, as long as I go early, right. And I can go and bring my kid and kind of have them see some music and get, you know, adjusted to that environment. Cause they obviously have been to tons of shows in their life. So that's always fun to see. Yeah. I love, um, I mean, this year's lineup is super diverse, but for me personally, that Saturday lineup is so perfect. Like having three of my all time favorite artists play the same day and they're all so different from each other is just it's like the ideal festival lineup. It's not like, oh, rock music's one day, folks one day. It's like you've got a little bit of everything, all three. It's fantastic. Yeah, the booking team, I mean, we we try to mix it up, right? We try not to be sort of like linear when possible. You know, it's like, okay, you have the Killers, Megan Thee Stallion, and Hosier on Sunday. Like kind of hard to draw a straight line through those mm -hmm. three people, but, you know, yeah. <laughs> it works just yes. fine. Yeah, And, you know, it's the same thing. It's like, okay, well, you know, who do you book with Tyler Childers if you're not like a country festival, right? Well, who the yeah. hell do you book with Trey if you're not a jam festival, right? And it's just sort of like, I, it, it, it weaved its way through, thankfully. Um, and and it's getting, you know, great response from the kind of that just genuine music lover. Like, wow, I kind of never thought I'd see these two bands on the same day. Yeah. Having Bad Rabbits, Tyler Childers and Frank Turner play on the same day is like my dream scenario. And the fact that it's real life and it's like 40 minutes from my house is the coolest thing that's ever happened. Yeah. And we, it, it's been fun with, you know, Bad Rabbits obviously was the first band that played the first day at the first Boston Con, but then, you know, even Frank Turner, it's like, we were, you know, Margo and I were joking about FNX stuff. I mean, we had Frank Turner at TT the bears one day, like uh, it, in the afternoon. Right. And it's just like, you know, uh, what uh, I was playing as, you know, I turned around like after Frank played and, you know, Josh Smith is at his usual TT the bears, you know, seat at the bar. And I'm like, is it 10 o'clock at night? No, it's two 30. <laughs> yeah. It's just, yeah. uh, you know, that, that was, that was one of the really sort of, you know, fun sets we got to do. And, um, you know, we did a, you know, a lot of sort of background business and curation with Aaron Dessner over the years. And, um, you know, that was sort of really funny to, 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 once I got to know him a little bit to say, Oh, you, you guys remember when boxer came out and we had you play like right over here at this like Irish bar over here. <laughs> it's like, that was you. And I was like, yeah, me and, and Margo. Yeah. We, that, that was FNX. That was the radio station. He's like, God, that was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, well, it was awesome for us. And you know, they're like, Oh yeah. Yeah. We did like a whole bunch of radio stuff around that record. And you know, that was really for us, like our crossover record. And, you know, we didn't really, we had to just trust in, you know, our agent, uh, you know, Kevin, who, you know, is still around quite a bit, you know, it was, but it, it was, that part was sort of pretty funny when the kind of the band realized, you know, especially the singer was sort of like, oh my God, it was right over there. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. My, I mean, a lot of people have their opinions on lineups. That's usually the first thing I say, oh, I hate it. Oh, I love it. And then I, I love watching it work itself out in the comments. That's my favorite part. Um, but my, uh, the one thing that to me is I wish, uh, with the merch that you would sell it after the festival, you had some kind of like, like market <laughs> where you're yeah. like, everybody just comes in. It's like, here's the merch from all our shows that we might not have sold. And I would, um, I guess I'm just putting in a request that you do that someday. Like could buy okay. some Boston well, yeah, I mean, old we, merch. I, yeah. I well, all the original City Hall Plaza merch that isn't in like a keepsake went to uh like a upcycle thread company. Okay. So nice. That was five pallets I can't sell you. Um yeah, okay. <laughs> I got some 22 in the basement if you need any of that. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I can just picture you at the end of the day just putting it. Here we go. Getting getting down and dirty, just putting your stuff away. Uh, oh yeah, we we had a big we used to have a big warehouse or whatever. So when you know when COVID hit and the warehouse had, was actually closing, we had to like go actually deal with it. And it was like five pallets on like the way top shelf. <laughs> it's like, well, I don't know. I guess I guess we'll just recycle it all. Oh man, yeah, that that'd be great. Or even online, I always look every year. Did they they 
they do a drop because like warp tour would always do like a drop every once in a while and you're like is it coming can i have it and it was like some limited thing and so that's just my marketing brain just out Are for me extra sorry sylvia are there gonna be extra merch stations this year mike i feel like i saw maybe a little something about that maybe not yeah we doubled it so yeah last oh. year the plans were uh insufferable um so we basically took the same size tent last year and just put it another one around the corner so yeah we, oh, we that's great we doubled, we doubled the merch output we're probably hoping to drop merch early this year like the second week of may and you'll be able to just go buy it online for festival merch nice. It'll never change, you know, if you want a Tyler Childers, Childers, Childers shirt, yeah. you'll, have to, you'll have to go and do it. But hopefully, hopefully we won't uh, in line along. That's, there's always one, there's always one thing from every festival that literally like it's the water torture that drips on my head for, mm -hmm. you know, 364 days till I can fix it. Uh, and this year was merch. So yeah, that's, nice. it's been great. we have a <laughs> great, great vendor. They do all the design. I mean, it's, it's, people love it. It sells well. Um, you know, they handle all the martyrs merch stuff really well. The, the bands love it. Um, so we just needed more, but yeah, more, more merch. Yeah. I have the, uh, well, with, with people might not know if you have a platinum wristband, you have your own merch stand in the platinum area. You're just gloating so. now. I'm so excited <laughs> about it. It's like, I don't want to be around anybody. I just want to go watch bands and eat and get some merch. <laughs> that's all I care about. Uh, that's so funny. Um, um, so who are some of your favorite bands that have played Boston Calling in the past? Margo? Um, that's like asking me to name my favorite child. <laughs> I don't know. There's so many. I mean, you know, having Tool and Metallica and like bands like the Pixies, all those kind of heritage bands. I certainly grew up with all of them. So it's meant a lot to me to have them there. Um, ugh, there's so many. I don't know. What do you what, what would you say, Mike? I mean, mine was, you know, I was like the biggest Metallica fan growing up, right? I was just like a marching band dork who played, you know, every Injustice for All song. You know, I had the book, you know, Lars's drum book and everything. So that was like, that was the kind of the biggest moment for me. Like, oh my God, I'm like standing on, you know, a stage, you know, in my hometown, like in, in Metallica is going to play. Right. Um, that was, that my was. Metallica was the first song that I learned to play on guitar poorly, but you know. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> like a, a dumb a down tab version but still yeah that 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 was a crazy moment but there there's there's been a lot the first year you know um seeing Mumford you know the it, it was the weather was finally nice we had you know it's it, it it becomes a little bit more about like my situation than the artist um mm -hmm. but you know I remember when we were at the radio station we all went and saw them at the Middle East like the first time they played and you know the place was packed and it was like oh my god this band's gonna be huge yeah, uh, we were broadcasting in Dublin for St. Patty's Day and they came to like the distillery and like we were the only station that they did, the only American station they did an interview with because they knew Julie Kramer and they just loved her, right? Because everybody loves Julie, right? And they were like, oh, well, well, Julie's here. And and so, yeah, like that was that was another crazy moment. But I, like I said, I think it was the situation. I had finally had like dry shoes on, you know, <laughs> like, the trash wasn't overflowing. It wasn't raining. It was like, ah, oh, cool, Mumford's on. Yeah, this is great. This is going to work out. Yeah. But I mean, also, you know, flipping that around, it's like, is there a band that hasn't played that you would love just selfishly for yourself to play even, even if it didn't match whatever, you know, the Boston Calling brand, but I think anybody would really do the Boston Calling brand. We, yeah. You get a lot of requests for Pearl Jam. Yeah. A lot of Pearl Jam. And, you know, that would be amazing, but that's a, that's a sore subject. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Like we, we talk to their camp all the time and, you know, Pearl Jam loves baseball and, you know, playing baseball stadiums and, you know, I, Hey, listen, it's like, if that's what you love and that's, you get, you get to make the decision. You're the band. Yeah. Pearl Jam's probably like the biggest target band that we've talked to for a decade at this point. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know if there's any like actual pinpoint, you know, obviously for me, it would be like, you know, sort of harder rock bands that would, that would probably sort of stick out, you know, um, I, I don't quite know you could do Slayer, but that would, it, it was a fun conversation. You know, we, we had, we had a Pantera conversation about the, the, the reunion, yeah. the reunion tour. And I was like, man, like you just picture them like playing on the blue station, just for like, a, <laughs> like, sorry guys, Mike's off the radio. He's got a giant <laughs> joint and a bottle of crown Royal in his hand and he's crying. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't think he's doing loadout tonight. Like he better leave. <laughs> 
Um, so that that would that would be fun. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Man. We enjoy wow. these, like they would be great. I don't think we've ever had the Smashing Pumpkins, which like I thought I didn't love, and then I listen again, and I I, I loved them in the '90s. And I'm like, oh, they're so good. Like, why, you know? Mm -hmm. So bands like that, Smashing Pumpkins. That's funny you say that. That's a band. I kind of feel that same way. Where I'm like, I'm not a Pumpkins fan, but then when I listen to the Pumpkins, I'm like, oh, I like way too many songs to not totally. be a Pumpkins fan. Right. Yeah. They're so good. Yeah, you're like, Bill, he's so whiny, but then you're like, ah, oh, he's so great. Yeah, yeah. And that was like the super bummer the Strokes didn't play. So, you know, mm. we, we worked with a guy, Dustin, who was a big Strokes fan, and we used to go out to Coachella. And Sunday night was always blackjack at the really crappy casino down the street. And he like forced me to go to see the Strokes on Sunday night at Coachella. And it was like black and white, big rock show, leather jackets. And I'm like, I know like a dozen Strokes songs. Like this was awesome. Uh. You know, but so, you know, they're, 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 I think they would still be a good one. Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah. Is there anything about this year's festival that either of you are excited about? Well, most excited about, I should say. You should be excited about the whole thing because you're working it. <laughs> yeah, every every festival is different. Um, so it's, it's we like I said, we changed around like the Platinum experience. It'll be interesting to see how that went. I always have a problem with like getting into the, the main VIP area green. So we structurally kind of redid that. So that's where my head always goes. It's like, okay, I've actually made five or six changes, right? Like see, you know, the merch thing was, it was such a, such a, you know, big deal last year and, and feel like we kind of let some attendees down. So it's like, fix that problem. But um, yeah, I think it, it's always site flow, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. how many people are coming and, and, you know, how will they interact and where will they go? And it, it, it's always surprising. People go everywhere. There isn't, you know, a fence to keep them out of. Um, but, you know, last year was really hot, right? So there's people hiding in nooks and crannies to, to find shade, you know, and then if it's, if it's kind of cooler and they're out more in the field, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's getting around and, and different things like that, but that, that should be great. I, I, I'm pretty excited on the, the Megan, the stallion thing. We it's, it's been two festivals since I would think we had a, a hip hop artist, like of that caliber, you yeah. know, like just massive. Her team is like really cool. Um, our like backstage security guy, Shante knows everybody has worked with every like major hip hop artist. And he's like, Oh, you're going to love her tour manager. Like he's just nuts. And you know, there's just people everywhere and it's a party. So those are always, always eventful things. It's like, we've worked with the killers before they're easy and professional. And same thing with Hosier's team. Um, we're, we're trying to see if we, if, if the Hosier manager is the same because he was nervous on city hall plaza that people were going to pick the bricks up and throw them. And I told him like, it isn't the, <laughs> It, it isn't a football match. Like, we'll all be fine. Yes. And, oh, and, and he, did, he didn't laugh. He was very serious. So we were, you know, we're, wrong, though, in that you could, because those bricks at the time were like falling out all over. We we're like, man, we should call the city and see if we can go take a brick and just like sign it with love from Boston. Um, so yeah, we, like I said, we, 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 we have fun with it. <laughs> no, I was just going to say like, I, one of the stages I really enjoyed that, um, every year is the, the, the local, I, I say it's the local stage that, that's the in that, that. Yeah. It's, I always find all my friends there and they're always like, it, it's a really fun time. It, the energy on that stage is always nuts. So like, thanks for having that stage. It's, it's different than the others. And I think that's like the very Boston, you know, location. So. Yeah, we were we were sort of worried for a lot of years, right? Cuz you, you don't want to like we had always said okay, we're you know, we'll start the day off with local, you know, local band on every stage, right? And just say, "Hey, like cuz that to me is like more important, right? You're giving them, you know, a a bigger experience than they're used to, you know, they get their trailer and the advance like everything like that." Um so we didn't do it, you know, for the first couple or whatever. And then it was more just coming out of COVID and, and seeing the amount of talent that was in the area and so many people had written records. And it was like, okay, I think we can actually, we know the site well enough. This isn't going to feel like some long lost far away place. Um, and, and thank God for the people that come to the show. Cause they, they, they fill that space and make it great. I mean, the artist mm -hmm. always does what they do, but like you, you get kind of packed in there. It kind of feels like your regular rock club, right? You're kind of stuffed in, you're like hot and sweaty and bands killing it. So yeah, it's worked out. It works, works really well spatially. And we've been fortunate with the bands that have played. 
I always like that blue stage just because it's on the like artificial turf and you can take your shoes off and you're not in like mud. You're just in like, <laughs> on like the nice like soccer is it a soccer field, I think, or something. It's a soccer field. Yeah. Yeah. I saw the year the 1975 headlined that stage and like the way the sun was going down, everything was purple and pink and then their lights were purple and pink and yeah. nobody had shoes on. And I was like, this might be the greatest moment of my concert going life and i don't even love that band but it turned me into a really big fan just like that one set it was perfect setting yeah, yeah. that was yeah. that was the weezer moment for us from the from the first festival yeah we like we're on like a sort of second floor in our office and i don't know i must have been what 6 30 6 45 or something like that and you know like like you said the sun was kind of going down they shot off a bunch of confetti you know and we we it, it's far away but we could see what was going on and you're just like oh man that's like really great we gotta go over here <laughs> <laughs> yeah we either they killed it paramore i saw paramore on that the headline that stage too i think maybe like 2018 ish um yeah. Sounds it was kind right. of that kind of that same deal like just whenever that that because that stage closes before the other two right it's kind of the the first one to shut down um whatever that headlining set is always has like the perfect sun <laughs> it's awesome cool i mean i was gonna say that this was having this episode was also the uh what, what is it the call to action to uh my my battle cry that we need to bring back such a cool thing as WFNX and the Phoenix, um, you know. <laughs> so yeah, it's about Boston Calling, but you know, it be, without those two entities, it you know we wouldn't be having this conversation. And I'm like, I always say to my cousin, uh, well, who's also our producer, I'm like, we should we should bring bring it back. But you know, I'll be up for be up for having that talk at some point. Um, that was ever a thing yeah it i was missed a, i missed there's no weeklies anymore nothing i know it was a, it was a certainly a crazy part of our life we we, we sit around and, and tell the funny stories and and you know margo you were a little earlier than me but we missed like the real you know that the stories everybody had was you know kramer would talk about sort of the late 90s and you know this crazy program director making record labels bring in thousand dollar lunches and and you just like you know there was Yola. just yeah, it was just like crazy, you know, stuff that that happened at that place. But it was it was fun to to sort of grow up as a listener, you know, and then uh, and then sort of be able to work there for a decade and uh, and be a part of it. it. Was it was great? I could barely get FNX where I lived, but I remember the first time I heard it, I was like, "What is this? This is the music that I want to hear." I just loved it so much, and I always wanted to work there. So, uh, you know. Lucky. Yeah. How long, how long did you work there, Margo? I was there for 10 years. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Same with you, Mike, seven, eight, maybe. Oh, three to, um, what? Oh, three to 12. Yeah. Oh, three to 12. So yeah, like nine years. Yeah. I guess we can just, I, uh, tell us where we can find information on Boston Calling. Yeah, everything is uh, everything is up live at bostoncalling.com. That's where we we send everybody. You can find all the information there. We're going to do, um, what are we doing next? I think our food release is coming soon. We're going to, you know, we do we do a, a a poster around the orange stage, which we were talking about earlier. So we have a poster and like a full announcement of of what's happened on the orange stage. And then I think we, I think sort of towards the end of next week is food. Right. Sweet. Download the app. Nice. Yes, I'm, ex I'm excited to see what I'll be eating this year. There you go. Yeah, you can plan it out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited. Well, that's uh, this week's episode of Stub Stories. I'm Sylvia. I'm Ricky. Thanks for checking it out. You can follow us uh, literally everywhere you can follow anybody on the internet. Thanks for being so specific, Ricky. I appreciate you. <laughs> People know by now. <laughs> And what's the tagline? If it's if it sucked, it's probably my fault. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> yes. Great. Well, thanks, well, guys. Uh, thanks thank for, you guys so for doing much. this. And uh, yeah, I look forward to it this year. Seeing awesome. you guys in person, maybe. You will. We know where to find you. Thank you. We're going to find yeah. you. Great. Should be in the All Sapphire right. Lounge or whatever. <laughs> Love uh, Sapphire. Yeah. 
All the lounges. <laughs> <laughs> Parking lot. <Right. laughs> cool. Thanks, right, guys. guys. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Yeah, I mean, if you guys have any stubs that you want to see, just shoot us a DM with the stubs. We love seeing your stories too, you know? Yeah, and check out our website, stubstories.net, and on Insta, Stub Stories, because that's where it all started. Yeah, we'll be on every other. We're on other platforms too, but so watch for more content to start popping up on those as well. Now that we're live in, in the game. Official. Thanks. Yeah. Follow our YouTube too. <laughs>